you know, if we're looking at a cure, because that's what everybody wants, right? A cure. Um, I think the prevention trials are really going to be the way to go because then you're stopping it before it starts. You know, we know that these anti-amyloid drugs remove amyloid. We know this. They successfully reduce amyloid to a point where people go from having positive amyloid PET to negative amyloid PET. Um, in fact, we had a, an occasion once where we had a patient who was in a trial, um, an anti-amyloid trial for some time, and then that study stopped, and then she wanted to enroll in another study, and it was actually an anti-tau antibody, and, and they did allow people with previous exposure to anti-amyloid drugs after a certain window of time. Sometimes they don't. Um, so when she had her new amyloid PET for that study, she screen failed because she was amyloid negative. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that's been shown in, in numerous trials with more than one compound that, that it definitely removes amyloid. So if you look at the PET outcomes for these drugs, they're great. Um, what are the clinical outcomes? What, you know, yeah, just like, like you said, nobody cares about a, a my, a marker or cholesterol, you care about the clinical outcomes and symptoms. And so none of that matters if, if you're removing amyloid, if the people aren't any better mm -hmm. or if they're continuing to get worse. You know, that's what was happening with the mild to moderate group. Um, you know, the original solanazumab trials, um, you know, people just kept getting worse because they're, they already had enough neurodegeneration and other pathology now going on in the brain that the, the, whether the amyloid was there anymore didn't matter. Um, I do think in MCI that there's opportunity for these drugs to work and, and you know, the FDA is considering the aducanumab data right now. Um, the, there was just um, last, or actually at the beginning of this week, data for Donanumab, which is a Lilly study that came out at the um, ADPD meeting, showing that it met endpoints on almost all of the mark, you know, the, the primary and secondary outcome measures that they had set forth. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't rule out the MCI group at this point, but in terms of sort of the ideal, I think prevention ultimately is going to be the way to go as far as disease modification and, you know, just like you'll go to the doctor and see you have high cholesterol and intervene then before you get to these, you know, bad cardiac or stroke outcomes, you know, you'll go to the doctor and perhaps have a test that shows you have amyloid and then intervene then so that you don't then develop cognitive impairment. That's our hope and our goal. Yeah, that make that makes hands down the most sense. And again, I, I'm obviously stating the obvious, but the more we can model this after a disease where we've had unbelievable success, like cardiovascular disease, rather than a disease where we've had very little success, which is cancer, because we have to wait right. until you have cancer. Uh, now, of course, I think liquid right. biopsies are going to change that, and we are really on the cusp of that. In fact, that's going to be a super exciting um, discussion we're going to have on the podcast in the next you know couple of months. Um, so the goal of course is to turn cancer into cardiovascular disease. It's to, to turn, uh, Alzheimer's disease into the same. So one of the most promising versions of these monoclonal antibodies to, uh, amyloid is aducanumab, mm -hmm. which is a drug manufactured by a company called Biogen. And it's been in the news a lot lately. Um, yes. I think for several reasons. One is it's a drug that made it to phase three and it was running two parallel studies. Uh, emerge and what was the other one called? Engage. Engage. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and to my understanding, very little difference between them. Uh, obviously, different sites and maybe a slight difference in some dosing, but effectively the same trial, which is not uncommon for how a drug like this would be tested in phase three because of the size that you need to have of the, the, the number of participants you need. Where I think it got interesting was. Um, how the results were interpreted for the two arms and then what a reevaluation looked like. So do you want to explain the story of, I guess, let's start with the beginning. Mm 
this was a well done study in that it had, you know, pre-specified endpoints. And that's very important for people when they're evaluating clinical trials, you have to pre-specify your primary endpoint. You got to call your shot before you, you know, go to bat. Um, right. What was the, what was the endpoint in this study and how did they go about evaluating? Um, honestly, I don't remember what, what the specific primary outcome measure was. So it, it was, co it was cognitive, but it wasn't like, it wasn't an imaging study. It was a cognitive study, right? I don't remember if it was the ADAS cog or not, to be perfectly honest. The story of the Embark and Engage studies is, or I'm sorry, the Emerge and Engage. Yeah. We're doing Embark now, which is the, uh, follow up for the people that had previously been in Emerge and Engage. Um, so the, the bottom line is that the study was going along and at some point they do what's called a futility analysis to see if it's worthwhile to continue spending their resources on the drug or to abandon it. Um, and when they did the futility analysis, they were not meeting their primary endpoints. Um, but after further analysis and looking at sort of a cohort of people who had dose escalated kind of in the interim, they realized that the people in the high dose group actually were meeting those endpoints. And so they went back and looked at all the data and in a very unusual turn of events, they were like, actually we were wrong and this is helping. And so they ended up going back and, and putting people back in the study who had previously been on it um, in this new Embark study, as well as submitting to the FDA for approval. And the, the, the numbers aren't necessarily relevant, but the highest dose, if I recall, was like 10 milligrams per kilogram. And there was also a stratification for APOE and non-APOE, which I didn't understand because they were giving a lower dose to the APOE4 carriers than a higher dose. And are they currently just giving everybody the highest dose in the revisit trial? Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about the current protocol. Okay. No, that's <laughs> okay. If it's confidential so, or not. But, but what's interesting is that there's something that's going to happen on June 7th. What is that? What, what are we waiting for on June 7th? Well, I, I just want to go back and touch on a point that you mentioned. You know, one of the reasons that they give the APOE4 carriers a lower dose is because of the risk of ARIA or amyloid related imaging abnormalities. So we know that with these amyloid drugs that remove amyloid, we often will see changes in MRI, either edema or swelling or micro hemorrhages. So ARIA E for edema, ARIA H for hemorrhages, um, often asymptomatic, but certainly um, were very significant in some of the earlier iterations of anti-amyloid mm. drugs and drug trials that were going on. And there was a distinct difference between the risk of ARIA in E4 carriers versus not. So that would have been the reason at the beginning um, that, that they would have been on a lower dose. I believe, and I don't want to speak incorrectly, but I do believe that subsequently they did fine with this drug that that was not happening. So they may have allowed the E4 carriers to go to the higher dose. Yeah, there was a protocol amendment. They did amend the protocol for E4 to go to 10 mgs per kg. Um, so- So June 7th. Yeah, what, what's, what's gonna happen? What are we waiting for on June 7th? Everybody's anticipating well, well, the Yeah, so the FDA is supposed to render a decision about whether they're gonna approve this or not. And what did the advisory board say earlier in the year? There were two different things. So there was one group that recommended, you know, approval. And then there was another panel that was like, yeah, the data is not so compelling um, and recommended not. So we really do not know which way the FDA is going to go. Um, there is a very large push on the part of um, families and patients who have gone without any new treatment for this disease for almost 20 years to say, it's better than nothing, please approve it. <laughs> um, 
I know, you know, from an advocacy standpoint, there's a lot of that going on. Um, you know, then there's some, you know, very strict science people who are saying, you know, if the data doesn't support it, don't do it. So we really have no idea which way they're going to go. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.